everyone, Pushing Up Roses here, and welcome back to a series everyone's grandma is talking about. That time on Murder, She Wrote. Today we'll be discussing a viewer suggestion. I was so intrigued by what they said that I had to give it a shot, and I was not disappointed. First things first, it's called The Petrified Florist. Murder, She Wrote often does use puns and play on words for their titles, but this one was particularly groan-worthy to me. It was actually the first note I made before writing this episode and before watching it. I won't keep you waiting, let's dive right into this curiosity. For this episode, we travel out of Cabot Cove and into the wondrous California city, specifically sponsored by Weezer, Beverly Hills. It's where you want to be. Our story begins with Frances Hunt, possible designing women reject, who works for a tabloid named The A-List. She has a pretty high position and appears to be in charge of assigning stories to her reporters. Unfortunately, a competing magazine named Star Scene is starting to get breaking stories before A-List, and Frances believes there's a leak in the company or their paid informant are playing both sides. Jessica! This is a terrible time! Yes, Francis is one of Jessica's many, 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 many friends. This woman is networked. Francis has a big dinner all planned for Jessica that night, but before that they run into Detective Caceres. Jessica helped him on one of his previous cases and they recognize each other. I am not exactly sure how, since he was played by an entirely different actor in his previous cameo. Jessica quips that she remembers he was about to get married and refers to the woman on his arm. I'm delighted to meet you. <laughs> no. This is my mistress. George Irwin, a new writer for A-List, visits Francis's house to drop off some A-List pages. He's greeted by Betty, who mistakes him for someone else. I'm, I'm sorry, I got kind of confused. Oh. Well, as long as you're here, bring it in. Yes, ma'am. He tells her he is the new writer, and she experiences some mild embarrassment. Is it just me, or are all of these actors made up to look like other actors? All I'm seeing are Glenn Close, Sherilyn Fenn, and Debbie Reynolds. All of the A-list employees and their friends arrive at the party, and it's no surprise that they're just as gossipy in real life as they are at their workplace. We got our rosé all day squad spilling some tea. Mostly they're just discussing the hot plastic surgeon in town and making subtle slights at each other. Seems to me you have more problems with gambling than Roger. That was normal. The other notable characters in this story are June Cobb and her husband, Arnett. He takes an interest in Jess, inquiring about her book writing process. I mean those suspects and plots. Surely you can't make all of them up. Women ain't got imaginations. As soon as Jess begins to explain her process, someone comes in and delivers a rather hideous flower arrangement. Check it out, we added some sticks. This is Billy Kyle, florist to the stars. Only in California do we have rock star florists. Jess starts to nod off and I assume she is either drugged or bored out of her mind at the mundane dinner conversation. She's startled by the sound of a dish breaking and decides to get some sleep. So this guy's dead? Sorry, this time around we don't get to see a corpse, which isn't common for this show, but yes, Billy Kyle is dead. He's no longer arranging flowers, he is pushing them up. The burglar alarm did not go off and there's no sign of forced entry, so Lieutenant Caceres, who has assigned the case, concludes that the victim knew the murderer. They do, however, find $5,000 in cash tucked away in the register. June is upset because, oh no, who will make my butt-ugly flower arrangements? He did the sticks so well. Jess and the detective start interrogating her and Francis about Billy. They also ask George where he was at the time of the murder and he explains he was in bed. By yourself? Yes, sir. Aw, oh, forever alone. Back at Francis' house, she and Jessica have a discussion about the investigation so far. His department finally caught up with Mr. Kyle's assistant, the one who quit so abruptly last evening. Then he's the killer. Whoa, what? No, that's not how this works. I've never seen someone jump to conclusions that quickly. There's a reason why not everyone can be Jess. Oh my. While Francis takes a call, Jess finds Billy's planner underneath the table and quickly skims it before placing it on a different table behind her. Jess takes a moment to ask Francis what she finds so appealing about the tabloid world. Sometimes shedding light on some superstar or media type isn't the worst thing in the world. Look, we just take unconsented photos of celebrities without makeup and then mock them. What's the problem? Some lab results get back to Caceres and they show George Irwin's fingerprints on the envelope of cash found at the crime scene. You know, as a teenager, we spent some time in juvenile hall. Then he's the killer. Caceres goes to question George and now Betty is there too. I guess after meeting unexpectedly at Francis's house, they decide to date. What is this place? These neon signs and early 90s designs are kind of amazing. George didn't kill anyone, but he was collecting money and payments and delivering them to people after they've been authorized. But who authorized those payments? Oh my. And before you jump to conclusions, no, this guy is not the killer. He is a lady killer though. Caceres is there to take Francis downtown for questioning. Oh my God. 
I'm the killer? New evidence places Frances at the scene of the crime, and she admits to seeing Billy before his unfortunate demise. Caceres tries to push her on the reasoning. Rendezvous wing with your florist at 1.35 in the morning? Well, now you're making it sound sordid. It was salacious at best. Billy Kyle was one of A-list's informants. Apparently florists are similar to hairstylists, and that they talk to so many people, they tend to collect gossip and information. So Francis was paying him for the secrets he collected. She insists that she didn't kill him despite seeing him that night, and in classic Murder, She Wrote fashion, Jess now has to defend her friend because the detective doesn't think her alibi holds up. This is super common. If Jess is visiting a friend in any episode, that friend will be accused of murder. So there's this weird little filler part where Jess notices one of A-list slanderous articles was about a famous baseball player named Davy Wells, her theory being that maybe Billy Kyle exposed some dirt on him and he wanted to get revenge. He's currently in the hospital, so Jess goes there to visit. At first, the nurse thinks she's a groupie, so she doesn't allow it, but Jess manages to sneak in after seeing the patient log on the counter. If I had a dollar for every time Jess just blatantly sneaks into a prohibited area, I would have like, a hundred. Uh, can you have beer in the hospital? That doesn't seem right. By the way, this is a classic TV and movie prop. Good old Bod Meiser. This guy has been faking an injury and paying off the hospital to keep him there so he doesn't have to play ball anymore. He also has an alibi for the night of Billy's murder, so he's crossed out rather quickly. Jess runs into the flirty plastic surgeon who was getting it on with Francis the night she was arrested. I happen to know she's a very passionate woman, but... I never believed her capable of murder. She definitely killed the mood last night, though. Well, now you're making it sound sordid. Jess overhears the nurse talking about somebody who was referred to by June and realizes that she must have a connection to the plastic surgeon, even though she previously pretended to not know him. Can I just point out this bizarre, awesomely weird 90s Art Deco lamp? Everything is marble and extra, and it's all I want in my life right now. My standards are so so low. June claims she was trying to be discreet about her appointments with a plastic surgeon, and that's why she lied about knowing him. She also makes a quip about having a leak, and that Francis has been so nervous about it she was chewing through her glasses. By sheer coincidence, Jess runs into a very beret-wearing, 90s-clad Betty coming out of the competing magazine's building. I like how she's right out there in public, counting her informant money, just right there for all to see. Yes, it turns out Betty is the one playing both sides, making money from both tabloids. But I'm not as upset said about that as much as I am her ensemble. Yes, police, I'd like to report a fashion crime. We got weird paisley and mom jeans. Jess walks in on Lieutenant Caceres getting his flirt on with one of the undercover cops, but good news, she's not just an undercover cop, she's an actress. See? The spinstery school teacher. Ah. Suddenly, Jess has her epiphany after seeing the sergeant in glasses and gets an idea for a sting. She will, of course, need the talents of her new friend here. I can do sexy, haughty, virginal, nervous. Excuse me? Hottie and virginal? What the hell kind of genres are those? I do love that she distinguished hottie and sexy as two different things. The nuances are very important. Hey everyone, Pushing Up Roses from the editing room here. Uh, funny thing, somehow when she said the word hottie, I thought she meant H-O-T-T-I-E. She actually meant hottie as in H-A-U-G-H-T-Y, as in arrogant. I'm not fixing it, I just thought this mistake was so absurd that I wanted to keep it in and ridicule myself. Hottie. Hottie. Okay, bye. Here's the plan. Jess makes up some new evidence, saying a maid from across the street from the florist saw the murder happen, bringing in a new eyewitness. She gives this information to Betty, and of course, Betty, expecting to get paid, gives that info to June. Her husband just happens to be there and he listens in on the convo. I have no idea why, maybe he's just naturally curious. Ah yes, today I'm playing the virginal hottie. Not knowing the sergeant is playing the role, Mr. Cobb pays her a visit and tries to bribe her, without explanation, with $250,000. He finds a gun in the sergeant's purse and threatens her vaguely before the lieutenant shows up. I killed Billy Kyle. He just blatantly admits to killing Billy Kyle, and I'm like, what? You? Why? This makes no sense. I don't even remember you. Then he's the killer. No, 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 this ain't right. In a weird turn of events, June comes in and explains that her husband was just worried that she may have killed Billy and wanted to bribe the eyewitness into leaving to protect her. She admits that she wasn't at home at the time of his murder, but she was just restless and went for a walk, then just tries to excuse them both. Wow, she is blowing some smoke up everyone's butt right now. Even if she hadn't done it, 
which she did, her husband just tried to bribe someone, then threaten them with a gun. They can't just leave. Okay, so are you ready for this? Are you ready to find out how Jess knew it was June? It's because June said this. I think the poor darling chewed through her glasses the other night. Jess says that Frances only wore her glasses in private, never at the office, so June must have seen her chewing them at the murder scene when Billy was getting his payment. This is a bold assumption in my mind, because going out to the florist isn't exactly what I would call in private, so the fact that Jess even got there is absurd! This little tiny tidbit is enough to get June to confess. Billy found out June had been cheating on her husband with the creepy plastic surgeon, and June couldn't afford to pay him to not expose her. She freaked out and killed him with a pair of shears. Furthermore, the detectives find June's bloody raincoat in their trash can. Wait, 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 wait. Who's that? She looks familiar. Is it Anna Nicole Smith? This is going to drive me bonkers until somebody tells me who this is. Also, I really wish this had been an old photo of Angela Lansbury because she was drop-dead gorgeous. Anyway, Billy had been killed during a phone call and... What? Isn't the guy on the other side a witness? What happened to him? Though the timing is horrible, Arnett goes out of his way to assure June that he would have been understanding had she told him the truth. Do me a favor, Arnett. Don't always be such an old fool. Caceres is about to arrest June, but she pulls a gun and turns it to Jessica, shooting her. As the gun goes off, Jessica wakes up to the sound of a dish hitting the ground, and we are transported back to the dinner party. Yes. It was a dream all along. Okay, final thoughts. So when this concluded, I was just baffled. I legitimately felt had and could not believe that none of this happened. I'm assuming this entire episode was meant to give the viewer insight on how Jess comes up with a story, and it turns out, it's simple. You just go into a trance, then write the story. Go to sleep, write the story. There were some hints scattered around the episode to imply it was just a dream. There was no corpse or crime scene shown, which, as I mentioned earlier, is not common. It seems strange when the episode glossed over it so quickly. The characters were also off in that kind of bizarro world way. The overly playful and comical lieutenant, the undercover sergeant, etc., and the flimsy mystery. That glasses chewing thing, that just drives me bonkers. I still don't think it really proves anything. It's almost like the writers weren't happy with the main plot, so they made it part of a dream, and that would explain why it didn't really hold up. Though I must say, this had to be one boring dream for Jess. This is all just the norm for her. There is one thing that makes things a little more interesting. The part where Jess finds Billy's book and puts it on the table. When Jess wakes up, Billy comes back and grabs the book from that exact spot. I don't know if it's on purpose, or on accident, but it could give you the where does the dream begin and end kind of thing. I rewatched this episode for this review and had more of an appreciation for it, especially the dramatic transition from gunshot to the breaking dish. And to be honest, I would like a little more insight on Jess's writing process and where she gets the inspiration for her plots and characters. It's a nice idea, considering we are on season 9 of murder after murder. The sheer amount of deaths in this show is now ridiculous, so it's nice to see that wasn't the case here. It's actually quite nice novel and a little more creative, straying from the show's normal format. Don't get me wrong, I still cocked my brow and said what a million times after this episode concluded, but I did like it a lot. I'm really glad this suggestion came in, and if you have one of your own, please feel free to leave one in the comments. I do consider them, obviously. And until next time, happy sleuthing. Hey everyone, thanks for watching my video on Murder, She Wrote, The Petrified Florist. If you want to see more from me, I definitely have some suggestions, but first, it's Patreon plug time! Yes, Patreon, where you can make all my Christmas dreams come true in the form of small donations. If you can't afford to support the show with cold hard cash, likes, comments, and shares also really help my channel grow. If you like me and want to see more from me, here are some recommendations. On the right, we have another amazing episode of That Time on Murder, She Wrote. And on the left, I have a breakdown of a questionable episode of The X-Files. Both fun times, if I say so myself. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one.